honey, get a haircut. Hmm? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> You can help support the future of this series by checking out previous videos. Also, subscribe, like this video, and comment below for a final chance to win the Friday the 13th Steelbook Giveaway. Winner is announced in the Part 5 review. Our next movie is Friday the 13th, the final chapter, an immoral and reprehensible piece of trash that sold more tickets on its opening weekend than any other movie so far in 1984. Welcome to Flaw vs. All Reviews, where we rate and rank the movies and shows we love and hate. I'm Ronnie Hayes, and today we're looking at Friday the 13th, Part 4, The Final Chapter, from 1984. The version I'm watching is from the Blu-ray off the 2020 Scream Factory box set. A number of factors led to this studio being ready to put Jason down, officially with one more movie. So they brought back Tom Savini to help kill what he helped create, Jason Voorhees. At the time, a lot of people working on the project really believed it was the final one. So they were tricked too, with a new director and a new writer, new victims, and hell, even a new Jason. With Ted White now putting on the hawk, would they give us one last Friday the 13th and also add anything new to the formula? Yet again, they start with a repeat. I'm gonna give it to you straight about Jason. Wait a minute, they aren't just gonna show us a full chunk of the previous movie's ending? Oh my, a recap. Okay, I see you. Jason's out there. This is far more enjoyable to digest compared to rewatching the end of the previous movie, especially when you marathon these back to back. <laughs> Damn, this looks like a YouTuber made that shit. And to be fair, they did push the release window up a lot, and I get that the credits break has become a thing by this point, but it breaks up the movie, and it really shouldn't have become a thing. Jason gets revenge for his mother's death in part two, and then he attacks a camp where he gets wounded, which spills over into part three, where we see Ginny on the news. Jason goes on to attack a group of friends, spending the weekend together nearby, until Chris plays Tag Your It with an axe to his face. This is Jason's murderous rampage over the last few days coming to an end. Continuity isn't just something people nitpick, it's vital. It's sewing two pieces together to make it feel like one whole. This is actually the same location we saw in part three. You got that damn deer statue, the part of the porch Jason fell onto and broke. I'll cut them some slack, but the wood beams aren't exactly in the right spots, but they tried. And for that, and then we see him, the legend, the myth in front of everybody, cops, paramedics, they strap him up and we watch Jason being escorted out of this location just like we watched Chris being escorted out in part three. They drive different directions though, so must be two ways in and out. I like how this cop car gets stuck in the mud and it's about to ruin the shot before skidding into motion. Planned or unplanned, it adds an organic mess to it all. Many fans believe this is supposed to be Chris hugging her family. Now you can think whatever you want, but in the audio commentary, the writer and director confirm they're actually supposed to be just family members from one of Jason's previous victims. Now that's how I view it, and pretty much either way you do view it, it works, and it adds some layer to the world building. Jason's movement is a cool visual, but also it instantly adds tension because it confirms anyone near him next is in trouble. Oh no. Aerobics on TV was weirdly popular. One could say they were the social media ass shakers of their time. Axel, you are the Super Bowl of self abuse. She's got some spunk. So does he, but her spunk is interesting. His is gross and sticky. Oh shit, she was in Back to the Future, standing near another one of Jason's victims from this movie. 
Why are the Kissin sounds so annoyingly loud? We can actually hear their spit trade locations. Ah! You better get that sucker in the icebox! It's cool seeing Jason when they're fooling around. It builds on to the tension, and when we see Jason slid into the icebox, we see his breath. It's a cool telltale sign building up the suspense. However, we'd hear him get out. This is especially flawed when they could have just had Axel turn the damn volume back on the TV. As you can see, it's a uh, cut hacksaw that bleeds, one of Tom Savini's signature uh, tools. A false body and a real Bruce. That's uh, lovely, isn't it? There he is getting a dose of uh, red uh, Karo syrup. Axel gets a wicked cool death. <laughs> Even without much blood, the attack on the nurse feels vicious. Part 2 had a solo final girl death to kick things off, but parts 1, 3, and now 4 have couples killed in the beginning. And if you compare them all, I think we're starting off strong. Uh, there you go. Well, all the tricks are revealed, aren't they? That's how uh, Jason lifts, uh, lifts a nurse. Oh, honey, get a haircut, hmm? Oh, ma. That alien mask is frickin' awesome. So the Jarvis family lives near Crystal Lake, and the house across the way from them was just rented by a couple teens. This leads to our trademark travel shot. Go straight ahead two miles and hang right. Part one had three friends and a hitchhiker. Part two had another three friends and the late girl. Part three switched it up with a group of seven friends in a van, while part four trimmed it down to a carload of six friends. All right, I think I got it. Among the friends happens to be the talented Crispin Glover. A year before he landed the even more iconic role as George McFly in Back to the Future. What the fuck happened? They have a ridiculous conversation, including a fake air computer. You're a dead f he thinks that's funny. He thinks that's a funny thing he's doing. But the two actually pull it off, setting up a running gag between them. Oh, hey, they did toss in a hitchhiker, but she don't last long. <laughs> Jason seems pissed, probably because he got beat by a girl twice. <laughs> don't laugh. You're next now that you're Disney's bitch. <laughs> I love these kills. They set the shot up in a clever way because they're done with full practical effects. Normally I check out during little scenes like this, but they did okay setting up the couples and these two friends with one of them being a bit more timid than the other. They come off as genuine friends too, with the more experienced one reassuring the other instead of putting pressure on her. Yeah, it's okay, they're bunk beds. Don't worry about it. Mrs. Jarvis is reading a newspaper that headlines the murderer's body missing. Not mentioning Jason by name as far as we can tell, but also a clue that it's been at least a day in order for the story to go into print, and a couple days since the end of part three. It's a small touch, but it helps to flesh out the world building. George, wrong movie. What boy doesn't remember the exciting curiosity of sex appeal? Nowadays, it's nine out of every 10 social media slugs slutting it up for clout. Back then, it was mysterious, like hidden treasure. I'll just meet you guys there. I wonder if this was done by a second unit, roaming the woods for a nice POV shot, because it's fantastic. It would have elevated the scene to have the actor in the shot, but it's great for atmosphere. No, we have no suits. Shut up, you dickhead, now fuck off. <laughs> Turn around. Some pack of patooties, huh? Tommy. Old slang that felt like it died off around the 2000s. Cutie patootie or just patootie. In the early 1900s, it's believed to be a corrupted pronunciation of sweet potato, meaning sweet ass, and it became sweet patootie. I say we revive it, but what weirds me out is I remember it being used to describe kids growing up like cutie patootie. To be fair, over the years, it also meant sweetheart and girlfriend. Anyway, this is all because of some carefree skinny dipping kids. Wait, not children kids, but you know, it's just, it's like saying guys and girls, whatever. All right! Oh, no. 
Another The Presence fake out and we are introduced to Rob Dyer. He helps get the car started and they drive to the Jarvis home where we get this weird ass line. Come on, I got something real neat to show you up my bedroom. The writer said Tommy was impressed by Rob's knife and it probably should have had better connective tissue. I mean, we saw masks. It could go something like, cool knife. Thanks, it's from this werewolf movie I love. And then Tommy reveals a mask from the movie or something, something quick. Instead, it's like a barely a glance at his knife. And then he's like, hey, grown man, come to my room. <laughs> what? Especially after saying this shit in the car. I didn't think anyone lived this deep in the woods. Anybody up at the lake today? How about kids? Are any kids, vacationers, people like that? Would you like to come in for a minute? What the fuck? Would you care to dance? My God, it is spectacular. Legend has it, that is how Crispin Glover danced in real life back then, and hopefully still today. Another nice atmospheric point of view of a beautiful, relaxing raft on a foggy lake, or a creepy death trap. I mean, it all depends on where your head is at, at the time. In part three, they called back to bacon, but here they said, how the hell do we top a hammock? The damn lake, that's how. This is a cool death, and how they pulled it off was awesome. And the actor really went above and beyond dealing with the freezing temperature to get this shot. Props to her, big time and they ended up using only so little. It's like they just kept filming the watch her ass jiggle. <laughs> they knew they weren't gonna use those takes. All jokes aside, it was likely due to the censors. Fucking censors. I only wish the director caught that death face because it's pretty silly looking. Back at the party house, one of the twins signals to the other to approach Jimmy, which seems like a little interesting angle. Just two devilish twins that wanna have some fun but also want to be ripe bitches about it. Yet they don't capitalize on that. The one that signaled wants to leave and the storyline there just becomes flat and underused. Oh, and I probably should have mentioned, hey, look, you know, they got twins. So real quick, sometimes people say the raft should have sank or started to sink since Jason stabbed through it. But I had a similar raft like this and the bottom is just material. It's the sides that keep it afloat and her body is probably pressing down on the, the slit he made. I don't know what raft they have here exactly, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. And again, we get a good scenery shot, but I wish the characters could have been a part of them instead of it just being point of view. They did great here, considering. He is rigged to be lifted out of the water on wires. And as you can see, um, the wires didn't always work exactly the way we wanted them to. It's a creative kill done with practical effects. And although they didn't hide the wire totally, it's impressive how much they hid using the fog and the angle. Okay, color me confused. Jason is clearly headed to the tent and Rob immediately goes back. When he returns, Jason is gone, and he broke his gun with his bare hands? I mean, if he can do that, why the hell is he even afraid of bullets? Now Terry leaves, and her twin checks on her from the second floor window, which is good continuity, and it's followed by a moody kill. You mind sleeping in the bottom bunk tonight? Barbara Howard playing Sarah is a bit of a sleeper hit. Why, you want to sleep in the top? No. They gonna fuck. Give me a few minutes. She did really well with this character. She didn't rush her lines, and she kind of oozed a young woman head over heels for her dream guy. But she isn't overflowing with confidence. <laughs> Holy Hell, loud sound spikes are not interesting jolts. We jump twitch because we're permanently losing the ability to hear that tone. To add insult to injury, literally, not showing the mother's death was some real punk shit. She was really nice and it would have been a mix of emotion. Now we just go deaf and we're left in a fog of confusion. So Trish goes out in the rain at night looking for her mom 
like you do. She spots Rob's tent. It must be close by, right? And then she goes out of the rain and sits in the tent. Okay, but why? Does she know it's his tent? Is she waiting for him? Even worse, he slashes at the tent. And again, why? Don't you dare tell me he thought she could have been Jason. Because how is slashing at the tent gonna hurt Jason? Come on, this is all a big bucket of bullshit. The dead fuck gag kept a bouncing playfulness going between these two. Why don't you run this through your computer, teddy bear? Before being put to bed. I think you are incredible. <laughs> Ted! Ted! Where the hell's Clark's grow? I adore the reverse shot kill gag. We've seen it before on Friday, Dawn of the Dead, and a few different more. They use a weapon with a cutout for the head, and the actors go through the motions so the editor can reverse the footage. And it's quick, but it gives a brutal thwack. They're twins. They rode their bikes here, so when one of them was supposed to leave a while ago, the other twin sees two bikes still sitting there. It's a small thing, but it's clever. This is a fun setup. Now we know Jason just killed Jimbo with the cleaver in the kitchen, leaving lots of clues. So we know he's inside the house and she's looking back at the door. So where's he gonna come from? <laughs> Hell yeah, the window. That throw in slow-mo, the vines, the rain, the landing. It is beautiful. The reveal. Rob is looking for revenge. His sister was Sandra from part two. Oh, would you look at that? Now the timeline is a touch fuzzy. So here, let's break this down real quick. The writers mapped the events of part two to four out in like three to four days, but they didn't have to lock it down to just so few. It could have been five days, seven days, roughly roundabout. Now there is room to play around, but not much. These events are roughly around a week apart, not months apart. Now, Rob has newspaper articles from the events of part one, and people unfairly count that as an error because it happened before his sister was killed. So he wouldn't have known to clip that article, but they forget that back in the 80s, you could, and it was common to visit your local library for old newspaper articles, even printing them out. So his sister gets killed, Ginny survives, and makes the news the day before part three victims even go to the lake. So it's a tight fit, sure, but Rob could definitely find out about his sister's murder, hit the library for some info, and then show up in part four. The concept of a survivor's sibling is interesting but it's revealed like they barely gave it much thought, just a slapped together backstory. And he goes on to say the intro victims are missing from the hospital. <laughs> I mean, come on, Jason carried two bodies out of there. Did he clean up the blood too? He didn't still have them when he killed the hitchhiker. So why take them? Where did he take them? Why do we even care? I don't know. The editing fails a touch here because Jason is now right back to getting done with killing Jimbo. Instead of Jimbo outside for the twin, then next to Jimbo again to kill Teddy Bear, it should have gone Jimbo, Teddy Bear, and then the bimbo. In my head, I just pretend they happened in the right order and we just see them out of order, whatever. Now that brings us to a more simpler kill called the Myers. Ollie. Just awesome. The behind the scenes is so cool because they had this collapsible fake face for different takes. It was quick, brutal, they showed just enough, and they added some great sound effects to match. Wow, he yeeted that axe. It's a bit out there. But damn, it makes you feel absolutely screwed if Jason is around. But you can't fix this one with editing. Why is this asshole going in and outside to kill? This starts to build on that teleporting Jason vibe, and that's no good. Jason's got a big thumbnail and it's silly as hell. Now is the best time to mention this inconsistency. In part three, which don't forget was just a couple days ago, he had more human hands, not these monster hands. 
In the only shot that shows both houses at once, the camera sweeps across as Rob, Trish, and Gordon exit the Jarvis home and make their way to the party rental house. It's an atmospheric visual that really ties these two locations together. Tommy finds the newspaper clippings in Rob's bag about the death of Harold and his wife, as well as Jason. One page even looks printed, which helps support the idea that Rob got a bunch of them from the local library. This will lead to a glorious moment coming up with Tommy. Meanwhile, his sister found a body hung up in the bathroom. Here is where we get to the beginning of a failure. We followed them inside this house, and Rob went into the basement. And guess who's in the basement? Jason and we get this moment. Some fans have mocked this, but if you listen to some real life 911 calls, chances are you've heard people shocked, realizing they're about to die, and they say something similar. I mean, it's brutal. It gives me a little bit more respect for this scene. And that's it for Rob. It unfolds a little weak. It's a good concept, but it feels like they didn't even use the character the best that they could. On the flip side, he's a good fake out for viewers thinking he's got backstory, he's gotta be important somehow, and Trish is at least safer with him. Once he's swiftly eliminated from the equation, she's in serious trouble. Surely she's gonna run away. Okay, after the initial shock, then she's gonna run away. Okay, maybe she's gonna make sure Rob's dead and it's hopeless, and then she's gonna run. Oh, come on, it's a basement. Where do you think Jason went? I've heard the director talk about how he wanted the characters to do things the audience would yell at them for. But here, I gotta strongly disagree. When it is something so stupid, we end up holding it against them, therefore not liking them, or not liking them as much. <laughs> Remember when I talked about Jason being in the basement this whole time? Well then, who the hell put her body here? We follow them to this house, to this very door, the front door with the damn yeeted axe hole in it. Jason is in the basement with Rob, unless there's a separate basement entrance, and even then that's still uh, questionable. This was poorly done. Plus, you seriously gonna tell me she can't step over the body so she smashes a fucking window? See, that's great. It is the party house, so he hangs them up like party decorations. Party's over, bitches. At this point in a Friday the 13th movie, a body, usually dead, once alive, must come through a window. And they look better each time they do it. Oh shit, they gave us both dead and alive coming through the window. I love it. This is where it gets intense and it becomes a rush. She frantically whacks him with the hammer. There's a great sound against his hawk. Until she thinks to use the other side to do a little more damage. You bet your sweet potato ass that's awesome. So is throwing the hammer with so much force, it smashes into the drywall. Unfortunately, how they tricked the shot was to use a wire to guide the hammer, and instead of using it at either end, so it looks proper digging into the wall, they used a flat top, so it unconvincingly sticks there. Plus, there's good lighting here, so why isn't the actor wearing a partial face piece around the eyes? Here, Jason has some nice, clean eyes. So what the fuck is this later? Clean up your room. Damn. I guess they didn't want to clean up the room. But those old TVs are pretty damn solid. I don't know why Hollywood was obsessed with easily breaking these TVs over people's heads. For a minute there, it was in like every movie. This is a tense slowdown. It's good to let the highs and lows flow. So once Jason is down, Trish doesn't act dumb, assuming he's down for good. The tension builds as she tries to sneak around him, just enough to lead him away from Tommy, knowing he's eventually gonna get up. I like to view this like Jason is playing dead, especially since he slowly goes for the handle. Oh my God! Seriously, the visible eye in good lighting is an oversight that shouldn't have happened. 
now the excitement ramps up with a chase. Old school running Jason Chase. Sorry, but I get frustrated with fans that are shocked when fan films have Jason running. It's okay to prefer it when he doesn't run, but the fans that say Jason doesn't run drives me nuts. Look here! Look here! Look, listen! He ran in two, he ran in... Well, okay, he was laid back at first, but once he sees Chris's sweet potato, he go! Toss in some rain, lighting, the atmosphere. It is 80s delicious. She looks extra cool, drenched in rain and soaked in fear. Jason is intimidating as hell. The start-stop style, it leaves you pumped. He's right on her sweet potato, and Trish does this one small detail that feels so authentic. She's moving her body away that's close to his hand on the rail with a squeal of sheer terror. I just can't do it. I can't take this shit no more, man. Now that shit is righteous. All in one shot, she tosses herself out, tumbles through the wooden X, and spins ever so slightly to hit that landing. Impressive. Ah, uh, but then some dope used the wrong sound effect. With our focus directly on her, it's noticeable. Oh yeah, the fan base is gonna be mad at this one, but come on. Tommy has no clue what's going on. His sister could be cut in pieces by now, and Jason is cleaning off a knife just for him. Yeah, some fans get mad when Jason runs, but I think both confident walk and determined run work really well for the character, and they both should be the accepted standard. He runs when he wants, and when his prey is wounded and slow, look at his confident strut. All in one shot, no close-ups, no spoon feeding us, she hears him and tries to set up a strike. Instead of putting his fingers in some pussy, Trish puts the pussy in his fingers. Oh look, it's that time of the month too. With great sound effects. Those fucking eyes though. And then suddenly Jason apologizes for his toxic masculinity and Trish politely walks him to the door. Wait, what? Oh shit, never mind. That's the leaked script to the next new Friday the 13th reboot coming in 2023 or something. Who cares? It's going to suck anyway. And Jason's gay. Or a girl. They haven't decided yet. <laughs> now this final girl puts up a fight. Jason! <laughs> I'm gonna lose some fans here, I already know it, but what the fuck? <laughs> this is forced. I mean, it's just reversing part two's Jason, mother is talking to you bullshit. This is fucking dumb. This is so dumb. Whoa, hold, hold up. Your, oh God, your face is a little tough to look at. As for how he looks, yet again, for continuity, his face is drastically different. They really should have kept the look of part three, and now he's just a monster. Now, as far as the look and how it was done, and I'm not talking about continuity anymore, it's not something I would pick for Jason, and Lord knows we're gonna see in a future movie, they have done faces that actually look like dog shit. But this one is done well. I mean, it looks cool. That shit is epic. They have his face twitch while sliding down, done with all practical effects. Huh, hell yes. Bro, you look ridiculous. There's no help in that. Now I could believe the machete fell out, but the wound is totally not there anymore in the back of his head. I like the idea that a vicious killer pushes a terrified child or person so far that it actually changes them, affecting them for the rest of their lives. That's how I choose to see this here. Die! Die! He's going to be just fine. Whoa, they couldn't shave the rest of his head? I mean, come on, really? <laughs> really? 
there's this ambiguous tease that maybe Tommy Jarvis has some bloodlust after killing Jason, and he might take on the mantle as the killer. Now, I don't personally like that, not even a little bit, but it's left open enough to interest those fiending for more, yet it can also be swept under the rug as a bad idea by those like myself who are not at all interested in that story continuing on. So that was the final chapter, and for some fans, that is it. They watch the others, but they view these four as a complete beginning and an end. Obviously, if I could go back in time, I'd want all of them to be better, sure, right? But for what they are, and part four's place in the slasher genre history, I think they did a decent job. They might have stumbled along the way by not fleshing out the characters, just like most slashers tend to do, yet I leave part 4 most impressed with Jason. Now the misshapen look from part 3 still looks a little more menacing at times, but they did a good job making Jason feel like a killing machine, bulldozing through anybody unlucky enough to step into his line of sight. And make no mistake, big old man babies like Siskel and Ebert back in the day tried to push their weight in the industry to get these types of movies soft banned by essentially bullying the... Uh, producers and studios into not making them and not financing them. In other words, if you like this picture, what you have liked, I believe, is the idea that someone will get a stick put through their body because that's the essence of this movie. Yet the horror community is probably bigger and stronger now more than ever before. And since it's all about the kills, that's sarcasm, let's take a look at the kill count. Part 1 has a clean 10 kill total with 5 on screen and 5 off. Part 2 gets a bit messy with 9 total kills, 8 on screen, 1 off screen. We begin the killer bonus where he is down but not out. And the very rare, it's up to the viewer to decide, does Paul live or die in your version of Friday the 13th Part 2? Part 3 adds a bucket of blood with its 3D with... 12 total kills, 10 on screen, 2 off, and we get another killer's bonus. And the final chapter adds another bucket of blood with a total of 14 kills with 12 on screen, 2 off screen, and there's no killer bonus. Jason counts as a kill because he will be resurrected in the movies that follow, and human Jason, you can put it, is definitely dead here. Now we remove the F's from the A's, giving us a map cinema score of 44, bringing Friday the 13th, the final chapter, to the top so far out of the four. And let's see how long it can maintain that lead. Coming up next, Friday the 13th, part five, a new beginning flaw versus all review if you want to help support further to get these to come out even faster you can find support links down below remember like button comment sharing if you're in the mix and throw it down with some horror communities online feel free to share the hell out of this uh, this was a monster of an edit and uh, i'm thrilled to have it finished i hope you enjoyed it so thank you be safe see you soon for the next friday the 13th part five